Hey, what's up, guys? You're listening to the It Takes a Village podcast. I'm Ashley, your host. This is where the struggles are real, the callings are heavy, the kids are sticky. We come together because it takes a village, and this is your tribe. Hey guys, you're listening to episode 59 of the It Takes a Village podcast, and I'm super excited to have you listening in today because I'm with Samantha Munoz, and she is the founder of Addison Reads and the creator of the Intentional Book Club. She's also sharing her story about solo parenting while her husband um, was away. He's a Marine, and they also traveled to Japan, and she raised their daughter there when she was one or two years old, which is crazy for me to fathom doing that so far away from family and friends um and so she talks about her journey with that and then we talk about just expectations the struggles of expectations on ourselves in general and as moms and then we touch a little bit about how books can really make parenting easier for us they could take the pressure off and how we can go about um including books as a parenting strategy so in addition to the interview that i did with sam i also did a q a for her that will be featured over on the blog If you're interested in what she has to say about the Intentional Book Club in this interview, in this episode, if you want to know more, you just head on over to the show notes page at ittakesavillagepodcast.com and I will link you to the Q&A that I did with her where she goes into more depth about that. So I'm super excited for you to hear this. Let's get to the episode with Sam. Hey, Sam, I am super excited (laughs) to have you on the podcast today and um, yeah, and just talk about motherhood and life. And I also saw that you were kind of sick lately or you are sick. Yes, you are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That stuff's going around right now. It's like that season. I don't understand it. (laughs) (laughs) Always when you're like the busiest though, like when you don't have time to be sick is when you're sick. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so before we get started, um, and I feel really bad that I'm like, oh, you're sick. And then I'm about to interrogate you for 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, what the heck? Come on. <laughs> so, um, before we get into it though, I wanted you to kind of let everybody know who, a little bit about yourself, who you are and what life kind of looks like right now. You know, that sort of thing. Cool. Okay. So my name is Sam, obviously. I have one daughter. Her name is Addison. She's super cool. She's two and a half years old and crazy and insane. She's not here with me. Um, She goes to preschool every day. Um, My husband is in the Marine Corps. And so we move around all the time. Like literally we've lived in Japan and California and just everywhere. Um, And that's fun. We live in South (laughs) Carolina now. It it actually is fun, believe it or not. I I enjoy it a lot. We've... um, my husband and I have been together since 2007. Uh-huh. And so I've been with him through his like entire military experience. And it's brought us really, really close together because we've dealt with like deployments and just like the works. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is fun, actually, like <laughs> in yeah. hindsight, like it all turned out to be okay. Um, and then in terms of like my daily life, I, uh, I'm a software developer. I work remotely for a company in San Diego. And then I also own my own um, business. And eventually I'd really like that to be like my full time thing because it's something that I'm really passionate about and I enjoy a lot. Um, But we'll just we're just kind of seeing how it goes and just following like my path in life and being accepting to like what is happening now and like willing to change as things come up. And, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. Um, And I love that. I think that's like one of the best things about this podcast is like I always ask moms, you know, like to tell them a little a little about themselves and um, like hearing that, you know, you have a mom story. But then there's also like so many women on here like you're doing software. I can't even wrap my mind around that. Like I don't even know how to use my computer half the time, much less like that sounds way too deep for me. Um, and then, you know, but just like hearing how like all these, like we're all connected in like motherhood, but we all have like such different like backgrounds and education and in careers. It's just, anyways, it's so awesome to me that, um, that I get to hear all that, you know, and bring it all together. Yeah. We're also different, but like you said, we have like that common thing that brings us together, which is motherhood. And, and in some cases, like being a wife and those things are like common, Um, yeah. So, wow. I didn't know. I was going to ask you a question about your husband being in the military. I didn't know he was in the Marines. My husband was in the Marines also. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, so you guys met before he was in the, like before he joined or. 
Yeah. Yep. We were high school sweethearts. <laughs> yeah. I was a sophomore in high school and he was a senior. And so we, we got together in high school and then he left for the Marine Corps and we just stayed together. What was that like to still be in high school and for him to be gone? And then like, how did your guys' relationship evolve with him? Like, was he gone the entire time from like while you were in high school or? Yeah. So, um, there's like a whole story that goes along with that. And I feel (laughs) like it really relates to like how our relationship is now. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, first off when he left for boot camp, it was so hard on me. I mean, I was only 16 years old and he was, um, like an adult. And so we actually, like when he got back, we broke up for uh, like, I want to say like five or six months and he was my first boyfriend ever. And so, um, yeah, like my first kiss, everything. And, um, so it was really hard for me when he was gone and I just felt like very detached from him. And I was young and like, I need, I guess I like craved attention. So, uh, yeah, so I was just kind of like young and I guess I needed attention probably. And so we like, I I was just like, I can't do this. Um, and then when we, we, we finally got back together and it was, it was awesome because I had grown up a lot and Mm -hmm we realized like, you know, even like with being with other people, it was just like, no, we're definitely like made for each other because we were both super goofy and crazy and our personalities mesh so much. Um, but then when I went to college, so I went to college in California and he was in Arizona and then in um, Florida. And so that entire time we spent apart, which was really difficult. We actually got married my junior year of college. I think it was junior year. Yeah. Um, just because we were like, we were ready to get married and we'd been together for five years at that point. And yeah. even though we knew we weren't going to live together for a whole nother year, yeah. we were just, we were ready. Yeah. Um, and so once I finally graduated college, it was such a lovely experience to be like, Oh my gosh, I finally get to like live with my husband. <laughs> yeah. And then we moved to Japan and then had a baby. <laughs> so I mean, and in there, like during college he deployed and that was super hard because it was like my freshman year of college. I was away oh, from my wow. family yeah. <laughs> and then he left and it was, it was so rough. It was probably one of the hardest things I've ever dealt with minus the eight, the last eight months we just spent apart where I also had our daughter, which that was like a whole different thing. Cause yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to ask you, um, yeah. What was it like to go through his deployment with a little one at home? Like, yeah. So, well, okay. So it wasn't an actual deployment. He was in, um, he was in Japan. So he was like forward deployed, which is just like he was maintenance over there. Um, but then he went to an officer training thing. And so, so I had her during that entire time. So luckily, like we didn't have that on top of everything, you know, like the, the scare and the fear of the deployment, but it was so hard having her by myself because I was used to his mm-hmm. help. I mean, my husband is an amazing partner. Like he is so involved with our, with our child and like yeah. with our family, we're very much like, um, I like to call it like equal parents Yeah. because we both like take the fair share of all aspects of parenting and like the house and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, so having him gone was like a huge missing link oh, yeah. in our chain. Yeah. So it was, it was difficult. Um, but it, in, I would say like at the end of the day, it actually made me gain confidence in myself and as a person again that I had kind of lost over college and throughout that experience just because it was really, really difficult. Yeah. And then uh, having my daughter by myself, like I had to take care of her and I had to make sure she was like okay all the time by myself. <laughs> yeah. And so it like, you know, I got confidence again because I like, I did that. So mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, overall I would say it was a good thing. Yeah, I can totally, re- well, not totally relate, but sort of like when my husband, he, before he was in real estate, he was in the car business and he would work like 80 to 90 hour work weeks. Oh my gosh. And so like, I mean, he would still be here for a short time during the like late evenings, but he was Mm -hmm. gone before like our daughter would wake up and he would leave. I mean like, yeah. And then he would come home like after she was already in bed. So like the times that he was home, like that's when she was, our kids were sleeping. Yeah. That that, sucks for him. Yeah. And we did that for both of our kids. And so, um, yeah, like I used to joke about like it being like, you know, you're almost like a single parent. I mean, not completely. Yeah. That's a whole different like, you know, thing. But yeah. in a way, you're just like surviving on your own. And it's like you and you don't get a break. There's no like tapping out, you know. Yeah. And like, it's really I think it's it's a different challenge than even being a single parent in that like your spouse is like still in the picture. Yeah. Um, and then they also want to have like a say in things and which, which that, that brought about like some other complications. I think like, 
I'd be like, you know, AJ's doing X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to do this about it. And he would be like, no, I think we should do this. So it was like, but you're not here. You're not dealing with this. Like I am, (laughs) you know what I mean? So (laughs) it's like, it's, I wouldn't definitely not say that it's more or less difficult. I would just say that they're unique challenges. Yeah. No, that's totally true. Yeah. You're like, don't tell me (laughs) like you're not here. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. And I had to really check myself with that because like, of course he wanted to be there right, and he couldn't yeah. because of his job. And, and so I would find myself making him feel guilty about that. And I was like, well, that's just not fair. Like yeah. how hor- horrible would I feel if he was doing that to me? So yeah. that was, yeah, it was actually really hard too when we got like back together because it was <laughs> like, re- okay, now I'm not in charge out. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Figure out the balance. How was, mm-hmm. the, how was that like being in Japan? I've never been like anywhere. <laughs> like, how was that raising like a family in Japan? I'm really curious. What well, that was like. I, yeah, I was just like you, like I hadn't ever been out of the country and yeah. like the furthest I'd gone from where I grew up, which was California was, um, Florida. And that's, I mean, that's still America. Yeah. So <laughs> just pretty much everything's the same, but, uh, so going overseas, like I was already pregnant. And so I think I was already feeling kind of weird anyway. Yeah. So I had like really weird mood when I first got there. Yeah. Um, but I guess, it's so weird because like, this was my first and only child. So I don't even have anything to relate, relate it back to, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess raising her there was just like how I would imagine raising her here, except for the fact that I had no family with me. Yeah. And like I, we, when we had her, we'd only been there for about four months and I hadn't made friends yet really. So it was very lonely. Um, but what was, what was cool was that, uh, my husband is Hispanic and I'm white. And so our daughter is like biracial and super cute. And the Japanese people thought she was amazing (laughs) because she was like, you know, very unique looking. Yeah. And yeah. And she's very like, I know that I'm her mom, but like, she's super cute. She's got like huge eyes and they were just like obsessed with her. Like just, I mean, seriously, I stopped in Korea to go, um, to come back to America one time to visit my family. And it was just her and I, and she was like strapped to me in like this little baby carrier Yeah, and she's facing out and we like come down this, like these stairs to go to like this landing for a train in the uh, Korean airport. Uh And I'm not even joking. There were like 50 Korean people that surrounded me and like wanted to take pictures with her and like wanted to, (laughs) it was so weird. They were obsessed with her because she was just like so unique (laughs) and it was crazy. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, I can I can imagine that being like super hard being in a place where like like I feel like even here in the United States like making mom friends is really hard. Um mm-hmm. but then add in like a language barrier, like how like what do you do with that? Like I wouldn't even yeah. know. Well, luckily I I I mean since it was at a military base, oh, there were yeah. plenty of other American people that I could make friends with. I don't think I wouldn't say that I made a ton of Japanese friends in general just because there was that language barrier. And Mm -hmm. I feel like Japanese is an extremely hard language to learn Yeah. just because it's it's just so different than English. Um, Because like my daughter and I are learning Spanish and she, well, I know Spanish, but she, you know, I'm teaching her Spanish and that's like significantly easier, right? Because we use the same alphabet. Yeah. (laughs) And yeah, yeah. So how did you get, how did you keep yourself sane and your marriage healthy like all those times that your husband was away? We, we practice a lot of communication skills. <laughs> so I like mean, before you we got to. married, yeah, exactly. Um, before we got married, we went to a bunch of different like religious related um, classes and stuff. Uh, I'm Catholic and my husband is not like affiliated with a religion, but he kind of has absolved my Catholicism. And so we went to a couple different things like, um, I don't know what it was called, like engaged encounter or something, but they yeah. taught us a lot of like lessons for communication skills. And so we, there's this one thing that we do a lot and it's like something that we do, whether we're arguing or whether we're like in agreement about something, yeah. but it's called the floor and you like have this little tile and like whoever has the floor is the one that's speaking. And then the other person just listens. And like, it's like a challenge to you to actually pay attention to what the other person is saying, not just wait for you to interject. Mm. And so I I would say that like, that's the biggest thing because we couldn't physically be there with each other. Mm -hmm. So we had to like practice those communication skills and it, we obviously don't always get it right, but I think we're doing a pretty good job and we're like almost 10 years strong. So there you go. (laughs) I was going to say, I mean, if we don't count that little blip, right. (laughs) I was going to say, do you think that like, 
obviously all these experiences are really hard, but like, I always feel like it's the valleys that really like, when you come out of those things that you're just like, like super, just like firm, like your foundation is like solid because you've already like had to figure out the hard stuff. You've had to work out like communication and balance and like negotiations and, and doing it at a distance. So do you feel like now, like that experience was actually more valuable to you guys as a couple than like just hard? Yeah, no, absolutely. We are really, I I feel like we're really, really close because of all of the things that we've had to go through and all Mm -hmm. of the time we've spent apart. Um, because, and also this is kind of related, like we are very firm in who we are as individual people because we have spent time apart. So we haven't grown too codependent on each other. Mm. And which I think is good because then I like have my own things that make me happy. And I'm still not the best about like finding friends just because I'm like more introverted. And I really like, don't, I'm really shy around people and he's like a little better about finding friends. So like he can, you know, go, go do that part of his life. And I'm more like, I'd rather just be by myself and do my own thing. But we like are really strong in who we are as our own people. And I feel like that makes us more interesting too. When we like come back together and we want to like talk about something then we're coming at it from like two actual different angles versus just like, Oh, we see each other all the time. And like we spend every waking moment together. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think that's good. I think that's, Um, I know like I was the opposite and then I like so relied on the other person to like find my identity that like when I realized that was actually not good I had to like later on it was like doing it backwards I had to figure out how to like work my way back to okay but who am I as a person you know who am I as a woman who am I without this other person Mm -hmm. because when you try to define yourself in somebody else it just doesn't like it doesn't work out. <laughs> it doesn't. Yeah. And it's the same way with like being a mom too. Yeah. Like if you get too wrapped up in like your title of motherhood, then you very easily lose who you are as a person. Yeah. And like my biggest fear is that when my daughter and my, hopefully my future children like grow up and leave, I don't want to be lost in who I am. And, yeah. and even like in my marriage too, like I don't want our marriage to be defined by our children. Yeah. I want to like make sure that our relationship is really solid and at the forefront of our lives so that when eventually they go off and they have their own children and their own families, we can be like, okay, now it's back to us. Yeah. So let's, you know, yeah. continue Instead our of programming. Like, yeah. yeah. Instead of looking Instead over of like and being like, you? yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I think that's, I actually mentioned this in another episode, that that was like one of my, one of my biggest fears. And that's what my husband and I, like, that's our whole goal is at first it's us because our kids aren't going to be in our house forever. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's got to be about us. Um, what were some of your biggest struggles at the time that you were like solo parenting, do you think? Ooh, let me think. I feel like just not having, not having someone there when yeah. I get overwhelmed mm-hmm. and stressed out. Like I, I feel like it was really hard to remove myself from like whatever situation was happening. And when, when I was solo parenting, my daughter was between the ages of like one and a half. No, I guess she was between one and two. And I, those are like really (laughs) hard times, right? Like now she's, I mean, she's still two and a half. And like, I I don't believe in like calling things like the, um, the terrible twos and stuff, because I feel like that just like puts a negative connotation on a situation. But she was in like those very difficult stages Mm -hmm. where she was like, she was just learning, or I guess she, she knew how to walk, but she was like exploring the world and like was starting to be defiant and Mm -hmm. tantrums were beginning to be a thing. And I was very quickly getting overwhelmed by all of that. And on top of that, I was like working my full-time job and Mm -hmm. had like my business that I was trying to start. And it was just like, it was so much. I remember (laughs) very distinctly, I was just telling my friend about this because she's also solo parenting right now. And so I was, you know, giving her like encouragement. (laughs) Um, and I told her, I was like the first night in the apartment that I had just got for my daughter and I, uh, I accidentally put one of those like laundry detergent, pod things into the dishwasher and like all of my like everything was like just ruined and and then I felt horrible because like I had made my daughter a bottle with one of those dish it was just like I I couldn't even sleep that night and I was just like (laughs) this would be so much easier if I wasn't by myself so I was just like on the kitchen floor crying so yeah those are the were the hard moments the overwhelming like I just cannot handle it Mm -hmm. kind of things yeah and it's like it's like the simple things that I could imagine would be like what makes it I don't know, like, you know, when your husband is around, you can just call him or text them and just, you know, tell him what's going on, like, right then and there and, like, get, yeah. like, step away and have him, like, speak 
life or whatever into you for that moment or like um but then you know if he's away like that then you don't have those opportunities to call and be like and just vent and be like oh my gosh I did this or that that you know you have to like deal with it on your own I don't yeah and then you can easily fall into the trap of being like calling them and being like this is what's happening and you should be here and you're not and this Mm -hmm. sucks and then that right there is what like really starts to crumble a relationship because again like that, you know, your spouse probably wants to be there and experience that as well. Yeah. Yeah. That can be, well, that'd be really hard to balance. So kudos to you guys. Cause <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, you know, I think that, um, a lot of military relationships really struggle or don't make it because, you know, that, that goes on and they can't figure out how to like exist separately or whatever, yeah. you know, and make it work, especially mm-hmm. when kids are involved. Cause it's a lot. It is. And it's, it's really hard on your children too, like to try to explain to them that your kids are gone or I'm sorry, that your, your dad or your mom is gone. It's like, what, I don't understand what that means. And where are they? Yeah. We have this, my, my husband just bought my daughter this book, I think like a couple of months ago. Um, it's called good night Marines. And it is like, I mean, it's just, it's like a good night story. Yeah. Um, but about like this kid saying good night to all of the Marines out there. And like, it's got all of like the Marine Corps, um, symbols. Yeah. But then at the end, it's like, I'm saying good night to my dad, which like, there's a picture of his dad and he's like off in, um, he's off and, and deployed. And he bought her that because eventually he's going to have to like go do another training. And so then we can explain to her like, okay, this is where your dad's at and he's going to come back and yeah, and make it a little less like odd to her, I guess. Yeah. That is great. Yeah, I'm going to have to put that in the show notes because I'm sure that there's, like, lots of parents that could use a book like that. And maybe um, I wonder if there's books like that for other branches as well. There probably is. I feel like there's – it might be, like, a series, although I want to say that the author of that book might have been a Marine as well, so – Yeah. Possibly not, but (laughs) (laughs) he found it at the exchange, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a really awesome idea. I think – Books are like an amazing way to explain things that we have no idea how to explain. (laughs) Right, exactly. Okay, so you had told me that um, at one point, like you had felt like um, you believed you needed to like be the be all, do all for your daughter. Um, How did you like kind of overcome like feeling like you needed to do all the things, you needed to be all the things and just be okay with like today? Like what you got done today Mm -hmm. is good. Like how did you change your mindset on that? I think it really came down to me deciding that not everything was a priority all the time. Like there are certain things that are really, really important to me that I want to make sure I do every day or like make sure my daughter understands from me as a parent. Mm -hmm. But we, if we come from the place of perfection and trying to be perfect people, perfect parents, perfect anything, we're just going to be left totally disappointed. And so instead I focus on like just the most essential things that are, that make me feel happy and thrive. And so like, for example, like making sure that I spend quality time with my daughter, that is much more important to me than, I don't know, I wouldn't even say cleaning the house because that's also really important to me, <laughs> but maybe like doing the laundry. Yeah. Cause I don't like doing the laundry, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. if, if I had to choose, I'm going to choose like spending time with her and yeah. because there's just only so many hours in the day and that is just, and it's so cliche to say that, but it is so true. Mm-hmm. And the sooner you just kind of accept that and frame your mindset around the fact that not everything can be perfect every single day and just celebrate the days that like miraculously everything happens. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. don't, don't set that as your expectation, set that as like, you know, maybe that's going to happen sometimes. Yeah. No, I think that's a really good tip is to think about like at the end of the day, like what would your ideal day end up being or whatever. And then like, just like, it's almost like making a list of like, okay, here's what's important for me to get done in a day. Like whether it's like family time or whatever. And then like not even stressing about the things that are like, if, if the things at the bottom of the list get done, awesome, but like, don't freak out or don't like, Cause I feel like that makes us awful people. <laughs> like when we put yeah. like too much on us and we're like awful mm-hmm. to be around, we're in a bad mood and yes. we feel like we failed. And then that comes out in our attitude and the way that we parent, you know, it's just, man. Yeah. It's like a ripple effect. Yeah. And then on top of all of that, I just, 
I don't know. There's there's something about like setting your expectations too high that makes you feel horrible. Like you just yeah. feel like you failed. And I've actually had to really learn to not do that just in every aspect of my life. Like mm-hmm. whether it be my job and not saying like I'm going to work, you know, 100 hours this week yeah. and make all this money. It's just like no, like I don't know, just recalibrate that and then because then every I'm not saying lower your expectations, right. right? What I'm saying is just be more realistic. And then anything that goes above that is like a bonus. Yeah. Instead of like you always falling short and feeling like I am not good enough because then that is what is ingrained in your head is mm-hmm. I had this like high bar for myself. It was too high yeah. and then I didn't make it. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that's a good one. Um, how did you, how did you figure out like what, what was an expectation versus like a re- realistic thing? Like, what was your measurement of that? Was it just, like- I think it, well, it just starts with like, again, going back to like the whole idea of like, what's essential to me and to make sure that I mm-hmm. oh, do yeah, that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then, well, but then like, if I want to spend like an hour, make sure I spend like an hour of quality time with my daughter or here, let's, let's do a different example. Make sure I like spend two hours of quality time with her. If I know that I'm probably like, I only have like three hours that she's home after preschool, like maybe set my expectation to like an hour with her because then like, you know, if I reach that, then great. And I, I, it's so weird though, because like, I'm also a big fan of the expression, like shoot for the stars because (laughs) then you'll land among the, whatever the clouds. But like, I, I think that that used to be like the mentality I had until I realized that like, especially in parenthood, yeah. that is just so, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. And it's just so <laughs> yeah. going to make you feel bad. You're like, whoever wrote that did not have kids. <laughs> yes. yes. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's more difficult. Yeah. That's <laughs> like, thing I've ever that's dealt like, with. um, was it daylight savings time? So I was like, whoever <laughs> invented this did not have kids because everybody like, or oh. the only people that are enjoying this, they're single people because yeah. nobody's getting extra sleep, but them like they're staying out yeah. late. Cause they're like, woo, we get an extra hour. So they're staying out late and then they get to sleep in, but that's not how it works. If you're a parent, they wake oh, up at no. the same time despite yeah. it's an hour. I don't understand that at all. I don't understand how I can let my daughter stay up and watch a movie with me until like 10 PM. And then she still wakes up at the same oh, yeah. time. I'm like, are you joking right now? <laughs> yeah. It always backfires. You're always like, I'll let them stay up a little bit later so they could sleep yes. a little. No. And, and sometimes they even wake up earlier and that yeah. just doesn't even make any sense. I don't, <laughs> I don't get that at all. I told I told my husband, I did not realize I liked to sleep as much until it was like stolen from me oh, via yeah. our daughter. <laughs> Oh yeah. Like, what was it? I, I saw something the other, the other day. It's like, I haven't slept since like 2010, you know, like that's no big hilarious. Deal. <laughs> no big deal. I want a sign that says that like have, not, have not slept a full night since 2015. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got you beat. I haven't slept since 2010. So, <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> You'll be there though. Wait till you add in more kids. It'll happen because it doesn't stop. It just keeps go- It just starts over with the next one. <laughs> I can't. Oh my gosh. We're finally at a space where like, this is, this is the bad part. Like we're at a space now where AJ is like way more, you know, self-sufficient. She can tell me what she wants. I mean, she for sure has her like bad moments. Absolutely. Probably at least once a day, she Mm -hmm. like freaks out about something ridiculous, but I mean, two and a half is way easier than like that one and a half stage. And so I'm Mm -hmm. like, I really want to have another baby, but can't we just skip that part? (laughs) Yeah, because you've already, like, ditched the diaper bag. But, yeah. <laughs> but there will be a day, yeah. Yeah. So, like, when you get to that point, it's really hard to go backwards. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> but you yeah. can do it. Yeah. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, my gosh. But we, okay, so we didn't even, like, really plan my daughter. She just, like, happened. Surprise. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a very happy surprise. I would yeah. never, ever, ever call her an accident, yeah. ever. But, um, so... I think that we probably would have waited a little longer, but I think it would have been the same thing as it is now where yeah. we're like, where we're like, well, maybe we'll wait a little longer. And I, I just do really feel like God was like, no, you're having a baby right now. Like, yeah. I don't care about anything else. Like you're having a baby. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you're, I think it's true. And like, 
um, used to like, I hate, I hate all those cliche things that's, you know, like the, the days are short, but the years are long, you know, all those things that, that I find myself feeling like are so true now. Like when I was, <laughs> before I became a mom or when I was pregnant, I, like people would tell me, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. It goes by mm-hmm. so fast. And I'm like, I want to punch you in the face because I'm as huge <laughs> as a watermelon right now. And I'm about to push something so big out of my vagina. So like those things I don't like people to say to me, but then like, it's so true. Like, um, it is. Yeah. Like you're never like, what's the one, um, you just brought up the one, like you're never really ready. Like there's never a good time to become a parent. Yeah. Um, because there's not, it just, yeah. and then you just, that's just because you just don't even, yeah, you don't even like know what it's going to be like. And I don't know if you remember, like after you had your first child, like you just feel so weird. Mm-hmm. You're just like, I am now responsible for this mm-hmm. thing. And I wasn't before I was responsible for me. And yeah. Yeah. It's like a whole weird thing that happened when you become a parent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So we did a little Q&A. Like earlier you mentioned books. And um, we did a Q&A because you have an intentional book club, which mm-hmm. is totally amazing. I really love the idea that you came up with it, the concept. And I think it's super, super helpful. Um, and we won't go into total detail about that now. But um, for those listening, if you want to check it out, um, you can check out the show notes and um, check out our Q&A about what she is doing in the Intentional Book Club because it is awesome. Um, yeah, but you mentioned to me that children's literature like saved your life and made you feel like you're a good mom. And so I wanted you to explain that a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So that's like totally melodramatic, right? <laughs> like, I understand that like, yeah. you know, it didn't literally like stop right. me from falling into a burning building or something. <laughs> I don't know. But... Um, you know, you brought up the fact that when I was in Japan, it was really hard. And that's the truth. Like I went to school for engineering and I was feeling like so lost in motherhood. Like I I couldn't pursue a career because we were in another country where like that wasn't going to happen. I was staying home with my child and that really wasn't what I had planned for my life. Like that just wasn't what I wanted to do full time all the time. Mm -hmm. Although now that she's gone all the time, I'm definitely like craving her around more. So that's going to change soon. But, um, yeah, but I was just feeling like I I was feeling that way. And then I was also feeling like, I know that I want my daughter to be a good person, but that just sounds like super overwhelming. And I was starting to feel overwhelmed. Like my husband would leave to go to the gym and leave me with my daughter. And I would feel like I can't even like, I feel unprepared to do this. And then that's just how I felt like, yeah, at the start of motherhood was I just felt so like I wanted to make her a good person and to like Mm. be a good mom, but I just felt overwhelmed. Mm. And then, you know, we were, I was looking for an outlet, um, just like something to get us out of the house. Mm -hmm. And we lived on base and there was a library there. And I was like Mm. taking her, you know, in the stroller to the library every single day, like every day, sometimes twice a day, just because I was just like, I need to like not just sit in the house all day. And yeah. Um, and so we started doing that and I started reading her books like when she was really, really little. Mm -hmm. And of course, like half the time she wasn't paying attention, which is fine. But I was like looking at the books more and I was like, wow, these are teaching really good concepts. And like you said before, it's like a way to teach your kids very complicated issues, like crazy stuff, like empathy. And like, how do you explain that to a kid with just words? It's really hard. So anyway, long story short, I, um, I decided like, wow, these books are really good. So I wanted to start kind of documenting it for myself and for AJ for in the future, just to know what I read to her and like what I thought about it. So I started a blog where I did that. And from there, I realized that there was this cool way that I was looking at books. And so I wrote a book called The Intentional Bookshelf. And then the rest is just history. I <laughs> I started a club called The Intentional Book Club because I have this background in um, programming. And then I have this passion for literature. Like, as you said, it just helps me so much as a parent that I want to share this with more parents and as many as I can and just share the share the message that you don't have to parent alone like you can help shape your children through something that is just so natural to be doing with them anyway which is reading so that's pretty much like the long the the abridged version but yes yeah No, I think you're, like, spot on because I think that, like, we put so much pressure on ourselves. Like, it's like we want our kids to be good handling money. We want them to be kind. Mm -hmm. We want them to be, um, you know, includers at school. We don't want them to bully. We want, you know, and so, like, when we wake up and we hit the floor, like, our feet hit the floor in the morning, we're like, okay, I have to, like, say all these good things so that way they learn all these things. Um, And then, like, 
just being able to get like pick up a book and know that okay, this book can take care of that. This book can take, like, it takes the pressure off of you, like, having to do it. And you're like, well, this author can do it for me. Like, this book can do it for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that that is super helpful and super awesome. Um, but, yeah, it was really um, interesting to see, like, how people get interested in, like, the things that they're passionate about, especially something like children's literature. You know, you, like, I just you just don't know, like, what sparks somebody's passion for that. And so... I think that's yeah. totally relatable for a lot of moms to be like, especially, and because I want to mention, like, um, I, I said that we weren't going to go deep into this, but like moms don't have a lot of time to pick out books. Like, yeah, it's so hard. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So, um, I mean, like, um, having, I know that for my daughter, since she's in second grade, but she reads like at a junior high level and she, so, but it makes it so hard for me to pick out books because those books have like things in it that I'm not ready to explain to her. So I like literally have to Google search everything that Mm -hmm. she is, you know, and like read the book. Like I have to either read the book if there's not enough reviews out there. And then I want to know like what moms think and like, yep. It's just so exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. And not to, I won't like, I'm not, this is not like a pitch about this intentional book club, but literally like that is the, one of the problems that I'm solving in it because I had all these people, all these parents who read my book and they were like, okay, now I want to find a book, but like, I can't go out and read like 200 books to find like the best book for my kid. And so that, that's really what this is solving. And it was a problem that I didn't even realize existed until I wrote the book and basically made it into a problem. Yeah. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) I was like, wait a minute. (laughs) No, but like for real, like I'm sure you've had a lot of moms being like, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Because every, like you don't, I don't know. It's like one of those things that we assume it's such a small problem that it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. But, but it is. It's like it exactly is, yeah. like re- letting your kids watch like horrible TV shows. Yeah. They're eventually going to pick that up. And if mm-hmm. they, you know, the same thing goes for the books they read, the kids they hang out with, you know, mm-hmm. you filter other parts of their life. So it makes sense to kind of help guide them in what they're reading. So. Yeah. Anywho. I definitely agree. Um, okay. So yeah, if you guys want to check out more about the Intentional Book Club, make sure you check out the show notes because I will link there her Q&A and you'll be able to find it. You'll be able to join the Intentional Book Club and you'll be able to see all the things about what led her to creating it. So before we end though, I wanted to ask you three last questions. Um, yeah. And um, the first being, since you're a bookworm yourself, I didn't know how hard this question was going to be for you. Um, it's and, easy. I got okay, it. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, I was going to say I can give you more than one. Um, but if you could choose, like, one of the most influential books that you've read, what would it be? Okay, so I actually – this is one of my favorite books, and it's not, like, a fiction or anything. It is a, it is a true, like – self-help type of book, but it's called The Crossroads of Should and Must. And it's oh. by, um, I think her name is L. Loon or L. Luna or something, something yeah. some combination of that. Yeah. And it is really about like stopping the noise of people telling you what you should be doing or even like what you have told yourself you should be doing. And I mean, this applies to everything, not even just like career paths, but like motherhood, yeah. life in general, like there's so much pressure to feel like I need, Oh, I should be doing this or I should be doing this this way. And it's all about like stopping that and Mm. just focusing on what you're called to do. Mm. And it doesn't even like have any religious basis or anything, but I, I, as a religious person, like I was infusing that as I was reading it and it, it is a fantastic book. And it is also super short. I mean, it's short because it's, almost all illustrations oh. and like she's I think she's a, um, a painter a watercolorist or oh, something cool. and so all of yeah all of the pages are pretty much like quotes oh, in you know her pretty yeah. like script and stuff and then it's got some words and stuff afterwards but it's all like it's also based off of um like short biographies about people that have changed the world by stopping you know mm. listening to all the shoulds and following their calling so yeah. yes oh. great book yeah that's so true like especially when you become a mom it's like all this unsolicited noise you just start getting and yes. then you like forget who you are like you're like wait no like this is what I want to do like mm-hmm. don't talk to me about that like I don't um yeah that's awesome and I can appreciate that it's illustrated because that helps me finish yeah no book. yeah it's, 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 I think I read it in like one or two days because it was so just mm-hmm. I was just like mind blown like this yeah. is so good yeah okay I'll put that one 
I'll put that in the show notes for sure. Um, if you could empower women in one way, what would it be? Okay. So I hate to do this because it's like, they're all kind of, cause you sent me the question. So I know them. Yeah, yeah. So spoiler alert, I know the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the last, the, these questions are all related to me. Okay. So the, I, I would, I would encourage women to stop feeling like they have to, to do whatever they think they should do mm-hmm. and truly follow what they are called to do. And I mean, whatever you're called to do in motherhood, whether that be stay at home with your children or send them off to daycare every once in a while or, you know, whatever. And then as a person, like, and I I think it really, it's hard because like, how do you figure out what you're called to, to do? And I think it's really about like, just sitting down with yourself and evaluating what's the most important to you. And then just like, just going for it Yeah, and not worrying about like, anything else, anything else, because there is so much freedom in just accepting that because there's been, I mean, I told you like my background is in engineering. And so like, I, it's been really hard for me to transition away from that because I felt so defined by that my entire life. Cause that was like what I was supposed to do. And then as soon as I became an engineer, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, it's not that I hate it, but like, this is not what makes me happy. Yeah. And so like being okay to say, okay, I'm, you know, yeah, I might be disappointing some people, but I'm going to make myself happy. And at the end of the day, like I'm the one that has to live with myself. Yeah. So following, like, I'd hate to be cliche, but following your heart and yeah. like your calling. Yes. Yeah. That is what I hope women do more often. I had Valerie Friedlander on the podcast and mm-hmm. she was, she was saying that, um, you know, it's motherhood is just like a journey. Like It all, you know, like you may start in one place, but like you, like if you accept that it's a journey and not a destination, like, you know, like you might have had this like dream of being an engineer and that was your destination. But then like, you know, when you got there, it wasn't exactly, you know, what you thought it would be. And then you just like Mm -hmm. stayed because that was your destination, you know, but like, if you think of it as a journey and like, I think this is true for all of us in motherhood is that we are constantly like evolving as like a person and a mom and so like things all the other outside things change like what we're doing how we you know like the plan that we had because you know things that's just how motherhood and life is so yeah 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 for sure um if you could tell your younger self one thing assuming that she would listen what would it what would it be (laughs) definitely will listen (laughs) yeah (laughs) just kidding um it related to that like just being open to like possibilities and not like being stuck in one way of thinking and just, I I wish, well, I think that I've learned this over time, but I wish that I would have like stopped caring about like making other people happy so much and not even happy, but like making them proud. Mm -hmm. I want to make myself proud. Like that's the first thing that it really should be. And then I make my like, offspring and my husband proud and then I can hopefully make my family and friends proud but like Mm -hmm. if if I'm not if I'm doing something that's good and I'm not doing something you know that they (laughs) should not be proud of yeah um you know then really who cares what they think and I I just feel like I would have started my all sorts of different journeys in my life so much earlier and I probably would have been further in them Mm -hmm. if I would have just accepted the fact that like things change, people change and you, and that's okay. Like we're not stagnant creatures. We are yeah. evolving. So yeah, it would be really boring if we, if we weren't so boring. Yeah. <laughs> so boring. Um, yeah, well, I am so grateful that you took the time, even though you're dealing with a cold or whatever you got going on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know. I'm yeah. stuffy. Okay. Yeah. So I appreciate that you let me ask you a bajillion questions um, while you can't breathe through your nose um, and (laughs) hanging out with me today. So yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you for having me. This was super fun. I love having these kinds of in-depth conversations about life and motherhood. So thank you. Thanks again, Sam, for being on the podcast. It was so much fun getting to chat with her. I hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I hope that it was informational. And like I said at the beginning, if you want to know more about the Intentional Book Club, feel free to head on over to the show notes for this episode at ittakesavillagepodcast.com. And there I have linked to the Q&A that her and I did that goes more in depth of what it is, who it's best for, what ages um, of children it's best for, all that stuff. It is so great. If you feel like you want me to cover a topic that hasn't been covered yet, feel free to shoot me an email at ashley 
at todayseden.com and you can leave an anonymous message. Of course, I'll see your email address, but um, I will not seek out your email to find out who you are or anything like that. Or you can shoot me a message on Facebook, Instagram, any of the social media outlets that you can find me and send me your topic ideas because I want to make sure that if you're going through something and you want to hear an expert speak on it, which won't be me. Um, but if you would like me to interview somebody or cover that topic, I want to do that for sure. So make sure you shoot me a message. If you are a Spotify music listener, you can also check out the It Takes a Village podcast playlist. Right now I have a family-friendly playlist on there for kids and moms to listen to in the car but I really want to create one for just you and so that will be coming soon so make sure you keep an eye out for that also I'm just so grateful for you guys I hope that you have a wonderful week I hope that some of these things spoke life into your life um, or brought light into the darkness that you're in and props to all you military moms or dads out there because your job is hard. <laughs> my husband gets home late now and I about lose my mind. Like if he comes home later than like 6.30 or something, who am I kidding? Like 5.30, I'm already at the witching hour of you better take these children or else. And so, man, I have mad props to you I think that you are extremely valuable <laughs> parents I think that you're probably doing an amazing job and sometimes you don't feel like it so I want you to hear this now that you're doing amazing you're doing awesome you're a great parent and you probably have more patience than all of us all right guys I hope you listen into the next episode sometime soon I like to surprise you guys occasionally now with episodes so I hope you keep listening and I can't wait to see you on over in the Facebook group or on Instagram. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, it's not that I hate it, but like, this is not what makes me happy.